Good evening, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, this is a CME program entitled Emerging Treatment for Painful Diabetic Neuropathy. And my name is Cass Heimer Delfan. I'm an interventional pain physician in Northern California. I'm the director of medical research at IPM Medical Group and also the vice president of clinical affairs uh, for American Society of Pain and Neuroscience. I'm also the vice president of Pacific Spine and Pain Society, otherwise known as PSPS. My practice is in Walnut Creek and I've been practicing for the past 23 years. For the last 16 to 17 years, I've been involved in a lot of different research studies, including some groundbreaking studies on spinal cord stimulation. And I've never been more proud to have been involved in one study led by Dr. Erica Peterson, who's joining me here today on painful diabetic neuropathy, utilizing a specific type of spinal cord stimulator. Dr. Erica Peterson is a professor of neurosurgery at the University of Arkansas for medical uh, sciences. She's, uh, she resides in Little Rock, Arkansas, and she's going to share with us some of her groundbreaking evidence using a specific type of spinal cord stimulation for painful diabetic neuropathy today. But before we get into her evidence and talk about this groundbreaking um, technology, uh, we need to understand the scope of the problem and what painful diabetic neuropathy is. Dr. Natalie Strand, the Assistant Professor of Clinical Anesthesiology and Pain Medicine, and also Director of Pain Research and Neuromodulation Practice um, at Mayo Clinic in Phoenix, Arizona is here with us tonight. And she's going to take us through the pathophysiology of painful diabetic neuropathy, the current treatments and medications, and the unmet gap that we have at this point for using this type of treatment for PDN. We also have my dear friend, Dr. Brown Holzer with us, who's going to take us through the evolution of spinal cord stimulation and what we interventional pain physicians have been doing with spinal cord stimulators to treat chronic neuropathic pain in the trunk and limb. Dr. Holzer is a senior partner at Southwest Spine and Pain Center in Provo, Utah, and we're really delighted to have every single one of you with us tonight. Without further ado, uh, uh, we need to get into this um, uh, program as soon as possible because we have a lot of really important information to share with you and uh, you will also have some uh, opportunity to ask as many questions as you have at the end of the presentation so please enter your questions into the chat panel and we'll filter through, uh, through the questions and answer as many relevant questions as possible at the end. This program is provided by North American Center for Continuing Medical Education, which is an HMG, HMP global company, and is supported by an educational grant by Nebro Corporation. So the learning objectives of this particular program is to identify current painful diabetic neuropathy treatments and the unmet needs. We need to understand spinal cord stimulation better by understanding the background and the evolution of this technology and then interpret new evidence for spinal cord stimulation for PDN at the very end. Without further ado, I'd like to turn the floor over to Dr. Natalie Strand, who's going to take us through a brief overview of the pathophysiology of PDN and the current treatments uh, that we use for this type of uh, disease process. Dr. Strand, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for that um, kind introduction. And it's my absolute pleasure to be here um, speaking about the current treatments for painful diabetic neuropathy and also the unmet need. I think many of you in the audience watching this know that this is a huge problem for the diabetic population. In the United States alone, we have over 30 million Americans living with diabetes and over half of these patients will develop some sort of peripheral neuropathy, many of those neuropathies being painful diabetic neuropathy. And just to put it into perspective, five years ago, the United States spent $327 billion um, on diabetes and complications. And that is about five times what we spend in our education budget every year. So, you know, this is not only a problem fiscally um, resource utilization, but it's a huge problem for our patients. And I think we all know that there is an unmet need. So I'll review that in my section the current treatments, what's changed and what hasn't changed and where we are today as far as treatment options. Next slide, please. So if we go over painful diabetic neuropathy, you know, as I said, we know that this is a very common problem. And to tell you how common it is, when I was getting ready for this talk, I did a Google Scholar search and there were over 17,000 results in peer reviewed publications since 2017 alone. So it's not that this problem's not being looked at. A lot of people are studying this. Um, 
painful diabetic neuropathy is a peripheral neuropathy. We know it's a peripheral neuropathy by the way it presents. It's, it's distal, it's symmetric, it's symptomatic, it's typically a polyneuropathy. The length dependent nerves present first, so it often presents in the feet um, and then in the hands, so it'll be that commonly described glove and stocking distribution. The mechanisms are not really understood truly, but there are several ideas of how this comes to be. The peripheral mechanisms include changes in sodium channel distribution and expression, uh, also changes in calcium channel distributions and expressions. And this gives us an idea of why some of our medications that we'll review work because we target these channels. There can be symptom, symptom, uh, excuse me, sympathetic sprouting, uh, so sort of overgrowth of dysfunctional neurons. There can be altered peripheral blood flow. Certainly, um, the small blood vessels get damaged over time with longstanding diabetes, and this can lead to neuropathy symptoms. There can be direct injury to peripheral nerves, such as axonal atrophy, degeneration, or even disorganized regeneration. There can be direct damage to small fibers and a lot of people think it's the glycemic flux. So not only the hyperglycemia itself, but the, the transitions from hyperglycemia to euglycemia may also add to the peripheral damage. Of course, there could be central mechanisms as well. And this is very familiar to us in the pain space. Central, central sensitization, you know, sort of this barrage of no susceptive inputs from the periphery can sort of strengthen this pathway within the central nervous system to amplify pain signals that are received. Um, you can also have changes in lamina two of the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, again, sort of ramping up this pain pathway and also reduced inhibition via descending pathways in the spinal cord. So the way I'll often describe this is that a, a dirt road turns into a six lane superhighway, and you really can suffer the consequences when those nerve signals are just sent more efficiently and more frequently. Next slide, please. Painful diabetic neuropathy can affect up to half of people living with diabetes. According to the International Association, Association for the Study of Pain, this is pain arising as a direct consequence of abnormalities in the somatosensory system in people with diabetes. Typically, this presents with those, those really well-known neuropathic symptoms. People describe this as knife-like, burning, shock-like, being bitten by fire ants. I uh, might feel like they're walking on hot sand. They might say their feet feel hot or feel cold or they they feel like they're burning, but they touch them and they're cold. So a lot of these sensations or these descriptors are, are sort of our trigger words for knowing that this is neuropathic pain. In addition, they can get allodynia, which um, is light touch causing pain. So they'll talk about things like sheets being painful on their feet at night. So they'll need to have their feet outside of the sheets when they're sleeping. Uh, oftentimes this pain prevent, presents at nighttime when they're less distracted. So um, they'll report difficulty sleeping just because the pain is so bothersome. This can really decrease the quality of life for people. It decreases their ability to participate in activities. Uh, they may be in isolation because they're afraid to go out or because they're so tired from lack of sleep. Um, this can definitely exacerbate depression and anxiety. We already know that this patient population is predisposed to depression and anxiety just from living with the chronic burden of diabetes. But then you add poor sleep and pain into that and you're really adding fuel to the fire for depression and anxiety. And one study found that over two thirds of patients with moderate to severe PDN had anxiety and depression and over 95% of these patients had sleep disturbances. So you can see between the mood alterations and the poor quality of sleep, the quality of life for these patients is very low and it can disrupt their ability to work, to be functional with their family, it can affect relationships. So this really is a huge problem, especially when you put that in the setting of the amount of people that are actually living with this, millions and millions of people in our country. Next slide, please. So let's get into the treatments. Um, I'm a pain management specialist. I, I also live with diabetes myself. So I feel this on a personal and professional level, but the treatments for this, they pose a great challenge. Nothing is very effective at this. Um, sadly, there are no current FDA approved disease modifying treatments. That's to say, you know, when you think about some of our uh, rheumatoid diseases and you have these disease modifying agents, you can sort of turn back 
um, the disease process, but there's nothing like that for diabetes. Um, none of the medications will have any effect on the natural progression of this. Um, and the natural history of this is to be gradual and progressive. So the nerve fibers will, fibers will continue to be affected. So since we can't modify the disease, we focus on managing the painful symptoms. So there are some lifestyle modifications um, that we use for prevention and treatment. Number one is glycemic control. Uh, we really have to encourage our patients to have excellent blood sugar control when possible, and also to reduce the variations while still avoiding the pitfalls of hypoglycemia. Lifestyle modifications, this includes the overall aspect of wellness. So uh, good sleep hygiene, excellent nutrition, stress management, exercise, a healthy weight, all of those things come into play um, with trying to prevent and slow the progression of these symptoms. Of course, modifications of any cardiovascular risk factors to include healthy weight, a lipid profile and smoking cessation, and then we'll focus the rest of my section on treating the symptoms with medications. Now you can see this touches so many parts of our patients' lives. So you really need a personalized and multidisciplinary treatment plan. This is very, very crucial. You cannot just have your blinders on and treat one aspect of this and expect the patient to really improve their quality of life. So the team might include endocrinologists, neurologists, pain management, specialist nurses, podiatrists, psychologists, physiotherapists, um, health and wellness coaches. I mean, there, there's, a, there's a huge team to manage um, all of the symptoms that affect the patients to include maybe an aspect of burnout you know, we hear about non-compliance a lot. I think that can be reframed of, you know, how do you deal with a chronic disease day in, day out for over 25 years? Next slide, please. So focusing on the pharmacological management of painful diabetic neuropathy, these are the most commonly prescribed treatments. Tricyclic antidepressants, of which we typically start with amitriptyline or amipramine, the serotonin or adrenaline serotonin or adrenaline reuptake inhibitors, the SNRIs, uh, duloxetine and venlafaxine. Of course, the anticonvulsants first line for many of us, gabapentin, pregabalin, carbamazepine, and topiramate. Um, the opiates and opioids are still used. Those are becoming less and less popular as we have, you know, sort of been involved in the opioid crisis, but also as the data emerges and shows that they really aren't that effective at, at these types of symptoms. Of course, there's topical agents as well, one of which is the capsaicin cream. Um, a lot of us in the pain medicine space will use compounded topical treatments for these patients where we may add a tricyclic antidepressant into the cream. Uh, we may add lidocaine, we may add ketamine. So there are several formulations of these compounded creams that we can use for topical agents for these patients. Next slide, please. So what I'd like to pose a question to the audience, and I know you can't answer me, but for, for many of you, you see these patients. Do you think that there has been any progress in your time treating this patient population for this problem? It's a really difficult question because as, as medicine is going through a renaissance in so many areas, I think in some areas we've frankly been stuck. So for here, you know, I think our expert consensus treatments for this have really been unchanged for the last 10 years at least. So the most robust evidence is really for pharmacological treatment using duloxetine and pregabalin, um, Cymbalta and Lyrica. Uh, there's some good evidence for Tepentadol, Nucinta and Tramadol. Um, tricyclic antidepressants as well as gabapentin are also widely recommended and utilized by people treating this patient population. And as I mentioned earlier, opioids just are really falling out of popularity for this. Um, there's really lack of good data to support their use and with the concerns surrounding addiction and adverse effects, and also with a patient population that has a high incidence of depression and anxiety anyway, um, you could really argue that these have a very limited to, to maybe even non-existent role um, in the treatment of painful diabetic neuropathy. Next slide, please. So not to say that there hasn't been any progress, because again, people are looking. This is a huge area of focus for a lot of people. A lot of funds have been placed into this. Some emergent therapies, um, including microgabalin coming out in Japan, and also high-dose 8% capsaicin patches that are coming through the FDA and also in Europe. 
Of course, there are several off-label therapies that have been tried. Again, noting that this is a difficult patient population, and typically by the time I get somebody with painful diabetic neuropathy, they've already tried the tricyclic antidepressants, the Cymbalta, Lyrica, Gabapentin. So off-label things include intravenous lidocaine infusions, Botox injections, and uh, off-label use of traditional or dorsal calm spinal cord stimulation. Um, combination therapy is common. I think it's common more because we don't have very many good options and outcomes rather than that there's great data to support it. Um, so there is limited supporting evidence. Again, I think you just balance the, the risk benefit profile. And as long as you're not having adverse effects, I commonly have pa patients on two or more agents for trying to treat this. Some studies have demonstrated that inhaled cannabis can lead to a dose dependent reduction in symptoms and otherwise refractory pain. So it is something to consider. Vitamin B12 supplementation has showed improvement in pain scores, quality of life, um, nerve conduction studies, and vibration perception thresholds. So there's some data to support vitamin B12 supplementation. But really, we need further clinical trials to assess novel therapeutic agents, optimal combination therapy, and even look at our existing agents to determine what is really the most effective for treatment of painful diabetic neuropathy. Next slide, please. So in summary, um, and just sort of the take home points that I want everybody to hear, painful diabetic neuropathy is present in up to 50% of all patients with diabetes. It typically will present within the first 25 years of having diabetes, but it can present much sooner for some patients. Um, it's a major cause of morbidity. It's associated with increased mortality. We talked in the beginning of this conversation how expensive this is for the United States and the healthcare system. Um, and of all the distressing symptoms of neuropathy, the, the pain is the most prominent and the most frequent reason for these patients to utilize resources and seek medical attention. This condition can have a profound impact on our patients. It can result in a really low quality of life, disruption of employment, impaired sleep, poor mental health with an excess of depression and anxiety. And then the recommended treatments based on expert international consensus have remained essentially unchanged for the past decade. So when I titled this section, the unmet need, I really mean the unmet need. This is a huge patient population that is suffering. And the tools that we have right now just aren't that successful in alleviating their symptoms. Thank you for your time. Dr. Strand, thank you so much for that excellent presentation. Uh, I've learned so much from you in the past and uh, today was no exception. Uh, you mentioned the the different medications that you're using at this point for painful diabetic neuropathy. It, is there a series of medicines that are the drug of choice for you to treat the patients with restorative management before you engage them with implantable allergies? Yes, um, that's an excellent point. You know, I really try to follow the data and the data is the strongest for pregabalin and duloxetine, uh, Lyrica and Cymbalta. So I will typically start with one of those and often uh, treat patients with both at the same time. Um, the studies on Cymbalta have shown that about 50% of the patients in the initial studies had 50% improvement. However, digging into these studies, you know, at first that sounds pretty good, which didn't really mesh with my knowledge, knowing that there's limited efficacy, but the studies really show a decrease of two VAS points. So 50% improvement in someone that started as a four, but went down to a two. But if someone started as a seven, they may still end as a five. And, you know, functionally, most of the time, I'm trying to get patients to a four or five out of 10 or less, because that's typically the number they report where they can be active with their friends, they can do the things they enjoy. So they're basically enjoying life with their pain. When people are reporting levels higher than that, you know, there's still significant distress and dysfunction. Um, so, you know, I think that 50-50 club, we talk about a lot in pain medicine. Um, it's good data, but when you look at what the actual improvement was, I think two points on the VAS scale is notable and it's significant, um, but it's less than optimal. I love that answer. Thank you so much. Having evidence-based medicine and using that approach for the patients is always the best approach. Thank you so much. Please stand by for the Q&A session and the discussion panel at the end of the presentation. Uh, with that, we need to go into what spinal cord stimulation is and what it is that we're doing at this point with spinal cord stimulation to treat our patients with chronic neuropathic pain in their trunk and limb and how 
a spinal cord stimulator of a specific frequency and waveform could potentially be used for painful diabetic neuropathy. Uh, our resident expert is Dr. Brian Holzer. Dr. Holzer is gonna take us through this. Brian, the floor is yours. Thank you, Cass, and Dr. Strand, beautiful job on your portion of this, of this talk. I certainly learned some things. I'm excited to be here with you tonight. The, the goal of this next few minutes that I'm gonna spend with you is to outline some of the historic uses of spinal cord stimulation, the initial advancements in that therapy, and then some, some really cutting edge things that have happened in the last four or five years that have the potential to really expand this therapy further to help more patients. I recognize that some folks on this call may be very familiar with spinal cord stimulation, while others may only know a little bit about it or, or not much about it at all. So I'll try to speak to both groups in a way that will be beneficial to everyone. Next slide. So the first spinal cord stimulator was implanted by Dr. Sheely in Wisconsin in 1967. It was used at that time, interestingly, to treat uh, unremitting cancer pain. So it wasn't meant to be in the patient long-term, which was probably a blessing because it was very large and very bulky and uh, a large portion of the system was externalized in that patient. Since that initial implant that showed that you could use electrical therapy to interrupt pain pathways, uh, most of the focus has been on changing the reliability of overlapping the paresthesia or what some people refer to as the tingling sensation they get with traditional low frequency stimulation, overlying that tingling with where their pain happens to be at because there was some initial evidence that that was helpful for patients. In addition to that, there's been a lot of advancements over the years in decreasing the battery size and making these systems much smaller and more amenable to be implanted in the human body. Next slide. So I kind of, anal the analogy I like to use is that we started off with this big bulky system. This is kind of a, a picture of an original cell phone. And over the years, we have been working hard on developing this next picture, next slide which is sort of our sleek uh, iPhone, not to promote any one company, but there's been a lot of advancements in spinal cord stimulation to make the system a little smaller and a little easier to utilize. Next slide. In general, historically, spinal cord stimulation indications have been for neuropathic pain of the trunk and limbs. That's what it's FDA approved for. Many insurance companies have focused primarily on two areas of that sort of neuropathic pain. Patients with post-laminectomy syndrome, which is also sometimes called failed back surgery syndrome where the person has had surgical decompression, the nerve that has been previously irritated is freed up, but they continue to have pain or a chronic radiculopathy. And then also complex regional pain syndrome of either type one or type two. The reason why insurance companies have been more um, open to covering those therapies is that there have been large studies that have shown that spinal cord stimulation is an effective uh, immediate treatment and long-term therapy op option for patients that suffer from these difficult diseases. Next slide. History of the innovation of spinal cord stimulation is kind of interesting to look at. I hinted at this, but uh, since 1967, and especially in about the last 20 years, there's been a, a dizzying array of advancements in the hardware aspect of spinal cord stimulation, um, complex surgical and percutaneous leads, different ways of controlling what type of electrical input the patient received, complex programming algorithms, because when you have these systems in the body, there are sometimes over 100,000 or more programming combinations that can be used, which is hard for a human to work through, so we need the help of computers. Accelerometers that show us what position the patient is in and can change the stimulation pattern based on their positioning. And there's even been uh, the introduction of percutaneous placement of surgical style leads. So that's been kind of the focus is in making the, what I call the tools um, easier to utilize and more predictable in implanting in the patient. Next slide. Generally speaking though, spinal cord stimulation has for a long time been considered an end of the road therapy. So patients have been through everything else, medications, including in, in many cases, long-term opioid medications, injection therapies, nerve ablation procedures. If the patient had been through all of that process and still had pain, then we started to introduce the concept of spinal cord stimulation. Over the last few years, there's been a change in that thought and it's been very exciting to watch that change to see whether or not we couldn't move this treatment, not as an end of the road treatment or an end of, end of rope, but one that's used earlier in a patient's care to see if we can avoid some of these things, particularly long-term opioids that we know have some really uh, potential problems. Next slide. I wanna take just a moment to talk about how the waveform of electricity is delivered to the spinal cord and how it's used to treat pain. I mentioned that for many years, the advancements in spinal cord stimulation have focused on the hardware, battery size, 
the way the electrodes are arrayed or put in, but not a lot of focus has been placed on this waveform. And this is just sort of a basic slide. On the very top there, you see that there are three real important components to that waveform. One is the amplitude, which I think all of us are familiar with is gonna be the amount of electricity delivered. The pulse width is for how long it's delivered for and then what amount of time is given for recovery. And the frequency is how often those waveforms are delivered to the patient. And generally speaking, uh, there were just kind of average amplitudes, pulse widths, and frequencies that were used for patients with most of the time subtle changes made within that area, and primarily that change being in the amplitude or the intensity with which the patient felt that tingling sensation. And you can imagine if you turn it up too high, the patient actually developed a painful sensation as opposed to relief of their pain. Not a lot of focus was placed on frequency. And generally, frequencies were ranging somewhere between 30 and 70 uh, as the frequency for, uh, per milliseconds that for a traditional patient. And that was just sort of left alone and not really thought about. So that's kind of um, described here in this lower part here. And of course, some frequencies went up to about 200 hertz, but not really much more than that. Next slide. And then uh, in about 2014, and really a little bit before that, there started to be some people much smarter than me that said, well, maybe instead of just focusing on amplitude and battery size, maybe we start to focus a little bit on the frequency. And is it possible that we're way off on what the optimal frequency might be for treating or pacing painful signaling in the spine? And so that was when 10,000 kilohertz was invented uh, as opposed to the 200 that I just talked about. That was of course patented by a company called Nevro who began to do some significant clinical studies that really had a major impact on the way we practice pain management, management the way we treated patients with that failed back surgery syndrome or complex regional pain syndrome I talked about earlier. Next slide. So this was a landmark study. I remember where I was at when the study was presented. It was at a big national conference with thousands of people in the audience. And it was such a big deal that it was almost a silent room. You could hear a pin drop in the room as this data was presented by a very well-known interventional pain doctor, Dr. Caparella. And essentially what he showed us is we had always known that spinal cord stimulation was good at treating leg pain. And that was the traditional low frequency type of stimulation. But this new way of doing it, this high frequency, sometimes referred to as HF10, uh, 10,000 kilohertz stimulation, was studied head to head with the traditional low frequency stimulation. And what you could see is we already knew that you could treat leg pain with traditional stimulation. But lo and behold, we had better outcomes that were clinically significant and statistically significant for patients that had been treated with this high frequency or HF10 therapy. So this was a, a breakthrough because again, everything up until this point had been in making that battery a little smaller, adding electrodes or arrays, but not a lot of big breaking um, data on a new way, a new waveform. And so this was a big deal. More importantly, up until this point, primarily in our practices as physicians, we told patients, listen, if you have failed back surgery syndrome or post laminectomy syndrome, we can likely treat your leg pain but we likely aren't gonna get your back pain and that's not our goal. But with this study, they looked very closely at both of those components, back pain and leg pain. And the next slide, if you could advance to that, shows that really quite well, that actually with the advancements in spinal cord stimulation and in particular with HF10, there had been this new ability to capture back pain, which this was very, very exciting. And I can tell you that it completely changed the way I evaluated patients and the therapies that I offered them uh, because of this new breakthrough um, option for patients. This study was published. It became quite a big deal. Uh, and Nevro, which is a company now, was sort of launched into becoming a, a major player in the treatment of patients with chronic pain. Next slide. We do see, though, that there are lots of people in America, this, this study's, this number is probably an underestimate, that suffer from pain, but a small number of them that actually get the opportunity to be treated with spinal cord stimulation. Part of that is because patients and some of the physicians and care providers that take care of them don't know about spinal cord stimulation. And part of it's because up until now, most of the studies have focused on post-laminectomy syndrome or complex regional pain syndrome, which is only just a small fraction of people who suffer from chronic pain. There are many other conditions, most notably the one we're talking about tonight, diabetic peripheral neuropathy, that hadn't really been studied. Next slide. I mentioned that up until that big study that came out that, that looked at HF10, all of the advancements in spinal cord stimulation had focused on those other things, electrode arrays, the type of electrode implanted, battery size. 
And now all of a sudden, somebody had presented really compelling data that waveform matters. And there was an explosion in the study and in the advancements on our field where people started looking at all kinds of things like burst um, therapy for treating things, pairing therapies like high frequency with low frequency, and even pairing things like high frequency with burst stimulation. And so it was a really, it has been the last three years, a very exciting time to be a part of this field because of these advancements. And I call it sort of like the wave wars, like these waveforms are all being evaluated and progressed and it's really an exciting time. Next slide. So the, the summary of this was that this therapy has been around since 1967. There's been advancements in the hardware, but there's really not been any new indications in the last 54 years for how to apply this therapy and who we can treat. In 2014, there was a novel waveform where HF10 or high frequency stimulation really changed the field and turned it on its head of making us rethink about how we apply electricity to the spinal cord. Or in other words, how do we go about pacing it in an ideal way? Uh, and it was kind of exciting to see that for the first time you could treat axial back pain with in a very superior manner with HF10. So of course the question then became, well, what's next? What else could be treated by this that maybe over the course of the last 20 or 30 years we have not treated well, but could treat better in the future. And with that, I'll end my talk. Dr. Holzer, thank you so much for that excellent overview of spinal cord stimulation and what we've been able to do over the last 10 to 15 years with the new technologies that can treat our patients so much better. You mentioned uh, the low back and leg pain study with 10,000 Hertz SCS. As you know, I was an investigator in that study as well. And I'm really proud to have been involved in that randomized controlled trial. Um, but uh, I want to know, since uh, the FDA approval came through uh, for 10,000 Hertz SCS in 2015, um, some people say the real world data doesn't really match up to the uh, published evidence that we collected over 24 months for that study. What has your clinical experience been with 10,000 Hertz SCS for low back and leg pain patients? Well, the first thing I'll say is that pain is very complex and it can be difficult to treat. Uh, and so I, I'm always prepared to meet with the patient and say, gosh, this, whatever therapy it is, it's not quite meeting your expectation. What else can we do for you? Because our job is to meet patients where they're at and try to try the best to apply the best therapy to them. My experience with HF10 has been remarkably positive. I think uh, I have patients that are happy. The stimulation programs have worked for them. I love that uh, the company that uses this therapy has really tried to expand and even offer greater and greater options for all patients so that we can capture and treat as many patients as possible. But I've had a very positive uh, experience. Most of my career was at uh, Mayo Clinic and I still go back every year and teach the fellows there. And as I work with some of those very distinguished, distinguished clinicians, I always kind of check in on them too. And, and they've had a similar real world experience with their therapy. Wonderful. Thank you. So thank you again. And Dr. Strand, if you could please stand by, we will have a key on a at the end. And I'd like to invite the audience to enter questions into the chat for the Q&A later on. Um, so we're getting to piece de resistance, the cream of the crop here, uh, which is the latest evidence for painful diabetic neuropathy by a study led by Dr. Erica Peterson. This is the study that brought 10,000 Hertz SCS, uh, an indication for painful diabetic neuropathy, which is indeed one of the first indications ever in the last 54 years of the existence of spinal cord stimulation. We're all really proud to have been a part of this study, and I'm especially proud to have been able to work with Dr. Peterson and um, as our leader in this study. Dr. Peterson, I know you have some compelling data to share with us, so please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Amardelfin. And uh, I really have to thank Dr. Strand and Dr. Holzer both for their uh, introduction as to where we came from in order to try to set up to do this uh, pivotal randomized control trial. Uh, next slide, please. So before there was the big randomized control trial, there was a pilot study, and this was the what's next. Can we look at peripheral polyneuropathy and see if there is a signal or response for this special kind of lower extremity pain that is different from the post-laminectomy patient's uh, lower extremity pain. So a prospective multi-center study was done taking all sorts of patients with a lower extremity polyneuropathy to look for an improvement in pain. And in this study, 78% of patients had at least a 50% reduction in their pain when they were, were determined to be responders. 
But interestingly, within the subset groups, the painful diabetic neuropathy population seemed to be the most responsive of all of the groups of pains with neuropathy with neuropathic pain. So that made a good case that perhaps this should be looked at in much more detail. Next slide, please. So let's talk about PDN itself. Next. So the study here, first of all, is also predicated not just on that, but also on the fact that low frequency stimulation, which has been around as Dr. Holzer described, had been tried for addressing painful diabetic neuropathy in the past as well. There are studies looking at 60 Hertz and other frequencies that show that there is some benefit. And these studies looked at 50% to 69% reduction in pain um, across the group of the RCTs. And this was maintained out to up to about 24 months. There were some issues with this, however, if you look at the next slide, what we noticed is there was an attrition over the next continuation of, of time patients stopped being responders, especially at nighttime. And if you'll recall that painful diabetic neuropathy as Dr. Strand described, really interrupts sleep. People have uh, the inability to cover their feet with sheets. They can't get rest. They're woken up and having to move around constantly. There are some other issues besides that. One is that a lot of patients reported that stimulation was uncomfortable. If you think about it, the mechanism of low frequency stimulation is based on creating a painful vibration or tingling, the paresthesia sensation at that low frequency. And for people who have painful paresthesias, creating a lower extremity paresthesia actually potentiates their pain instead of alleviating it. And so that uncomfortable stimulation was a reported complication. And additionally, patients also reported a need to exchange their batteries for several reasons in the study. And so the question of durability over the long term wasn't really resolved well enough at low frequency. So high frequency had a few reasons to be looked at. Next slide, please. So what I'm going to show you now all comes from the results of the study that Dr. Emmer Delphin has been alluding to, and he and I are a part of a group of co-authors across 18 U.S. centers who completed a prospective randomized control trial, and then this is the six-month results that were published in JAMA Neurology about six months ago. Next slide, please. The way the study is designed is a randomized control trial, and we had 216 patients recruited across our U.S. centers to either conventional medical management alone or to CMM plus placement of a spinal cord stimulator delivering the proprietary patented 10 kilohertz frequency. The location of these electrodes, as you can see in the x-rays is in the mid thoracic region between T8 and T11. And these patients really, we tried to have a real world representative group of patients. Their hemoglobin A1C needed to be under 10. They needed to have a BMI less than 45. Their pain scores had to be greater than five on average in their lower extremities. And we had medical monitors involved in assessing these patients and making sure they were appropriate to participate both at enrollment and throughout the study. In addition to looking at pain relief, we also looked at functional quality of life and one of the things that really hadn't been looked at much before, we looked at neurological changes in these patients because if you'll remember, PDN can be progressive. So we wanna make sure that patients don't develop worsening deficits. And we also had a signal from that pilot study of PPN at 10 kilohertz that suggested there may be some neurological improvements and we wanted to observe that. This was a crossover design. So patients who were dissatisfied with the treatment they were receiving in the arm they were randomized in could switch to the other arm at six months. Next slide, please. So this shows you the flow of the study. There were 216 patients randomized and you can see them when we get down to the three month data, uh, this is the per protocol population. And we analyzed the 96 patients in the conventional medical management arm and 88 in the stimulator arm. And then we continued to the six month data after meeting the primary endpoints at three months and analyzed again, 93 in the CMM arm and 87 in the stimulator arm. Next slide. Next click. There we are. So just to highlight a couple of the differences between groups, there really weren't any. In terms of age, in terms of the distribution of type one and type two diabetes, the time since diagnosis with diabetes, the time since the onset of peripheral neuropathy, all of these were equivalent between the two groups. Similarly, BMI and hemoglobin A1C numbers were also no difference between the two groups. Next slide, please. 
The primary endpoint was a combination of evaluating efficacy, that is how many people had a reduction in pain while also evaluating safety, how many people didn't have any change in their neurological baseline. And what we found is that 86% of patients in the stimulator arm were responders with at least a 50% improvement in their pain while having no neurological changes. And when we compared that to the conventional medical management arm, 5% met that primary endpoint of no neurological change with a 50% reduction in pain. We also looked at this in the intention to treat population and completed an analytics that showed that this was equivalent in both the per protocol and ITT populations. So our conclusion is that 10 kilohertz spinal cord stimulation for painful diabetic neuropathy was both safe and effective. And then we could continue on to collect the data and then do the analysis at six months. Next slide, please. This shows you where the trend is in the change in pain score. And this matches some of what, what you saw in the graph from Dr. Holzer with the back and leg pain. We saw an average of pain score at the start greater than seven. And after a stimulator was implanted and activated, a significant decrease in that pain from seven to 2.4. And then that's maintained below two out through six months. When you compare that to the CMM arm, you don't see any change at all. Next slide, please. When you look at the responder rates, we characterize responder again as having at least a 50% reduction in pain. And that's where the vertical red line is on each one of these plots. A bar of, on each one of these is an individual patient. And you can see that we have 5% responders to the CMM arm versus 85% responders to 10 kilohertz stimulation. We define remitter as a patient whose pain score went below three and stayed below three for six months. And there were 60% remitters in the spinal cord stimulation population compared to one percent in the CMM arm. And in fact, the average pain relief um, worsened in the CMM arm with a minus 2% worsening, whereas we had a 76% pain relief in the stimulator arm on average. Next slide, please. In addition to seeing the pain relief, we also saw improvements in neurological examination at six months. This again was part of that uh, signal. We wanted to see what neurological changes there might be. And so this was based on physical examination, looking at motor strength, reflexes, sensory, as well as the 10 point monofilament and pinprick examination. This was designed by the neurological group that were obviously clinician experts who were part of our protocol design. And the reason that pinprick and monofilament was chosen was because these are limb sparing assessments for the fundamental baseline amount of sensation that's necessary to be protective to help against wound complications or low extremity ulcer or amputation risk for patients with diabetes. And what we found and when we asked uh, investigators is that on their assessment of these, 61.9% of patients in the stimulator arm had a neurological improvement over baseline at six months compared to 3% of the patient population in the CMM arm. Next slide, please. Again, that could have been either motor, sensory, or reflex improvement, but what we saw is the majority of those were sensory improvements for these patients. Next slide. We also asked patients what they felt themselves uh, at the baseline patients before they had a stimulator implanted. They drew out a map of on their lower extremities where they felt each one of these dysesthesias. And you'll notice the numbers are different here because not every patient had the exact same qualities of their neuropathic pain. Numbness was most common. And you can see in the areas that are red at baseline, that 80% of patients had surface area of numbness over the soles of their feet. And then when you compare that at six months, the aggregate amount of surface area affected by each one of these dysesthesias had significantly decreased for all the patients. So both based on an investigator physical examination and assessment of neurological function, as well as the patient reported dysesthesias, we see neurological changes that suggest improvement for this patient population. The first time this has been demonstrated in a study using spinal cord stimulation. Next up, slide, please. Adverse events. I get this question a lot and it's very important. We collected all of this. Infection by far is the thing that people ask the most about in patients who are di have diabetes. Aren't we at higher risk of infection with having a surgery that requires an implanted device? Aren't we worried about wound healing? And when we compared actually 
the 2.7% rate of infection that we saw at six months, uh, that correlates very well to the risk of infection for using an implanted spinal cord stimulator in a patient population that is, does not have diabetes. So we didn't find that there was any significant elevation in the rate of infection just because we were uh, studying a patient population with diabetes. Uh, of note, two of the patients that had infections required a removal and explantation of their device. The third patient was able to be treated with uh, medical management with antibiotics and was able to be resolved. Next slide, please. Next slide. Quality of life. Well, as I mentioned earlier, nighttime pain that disrupts sleep can be really a significant issue. And that's something that we looked at in patients. And here you can see on this graph, again, that the improvements in sleep correlate with the changes we saw in pain score as well. Patients have fewer to sleep disturbances due to pain in terms of having trouble falling asleep, staying asleep, and being awakened from pain uh, after a stimulator is placed than they do when they are being treated with conventional medical management. We also asked patients about satisfaction, and you can see in the green bars that the majority of patients with the stimulator implanted were very satisfied or satisfied with their treatment and their pain relief compared to those in the CMM arm who were not satisfied at six months. Next slide, please. Really important point to note, there's no difference in the hemoglobin A1C values at six months in either group, nor is there a change in BMI over that time. So even though we see an improvement in pain, improvement in quality of life, that doesn't translate in the stimulator arm into these measures. Next slide. We also looked at health related quality of life. And as you'd expect in the stimulator arm, the quality of life improved for these patients on the EQ5D scale compared to in the CMM arm where it remained unchanged or actually declined. Parenthetically, uh, this was, an, uh, was not one of our primary observed endpoints, but we did observe reported uh, usage of opioids in, uh, in these patients. And what we found is that 23% of the stimulator patients were able to decrease or eliminate the use of opioids, whereas 8% of CMM patients did. There was an increase in use of opioids in 2% of the 10 kilohertz stimulation patients compared to 11% who increased in the CMM arm. And this is a really interesting statistic at six months. And I would like for this to be something that we study in more detail as we continue to gather the data through 24 months in the study. But it was observed that there were seven fewer hospital visits and ER visits per hundred in the 10 kilohertz stimulator group compared to the CMM arm after the stimulator was implanted. So if that really translates into an improvement in healthcare utilization, that'll be another real impact and um, implication for benefits that these patients can accomplish. Next slide, please. I mentioned crossover and the definition for opportunity for crossover, patients had to be dissatisfied with their current therapy, have less than 50% pain relief, and they had to be medically appropriate to cross. And what we could see in the table here is that no patients in the stimulator arm met the criteria to cross over, but 88% of the patients in the CMM arm did meet those criteria and 76 of the 82 that met criteria did choose to cross over. All of those crossover implants have been completed and we're now following those those patients out for 24 months after their implant as well. And all of the patients who were originally randomized to 10 kilohertz stimulation have completed at least through 12 months of, uh, of follow-up. Next slide, please. I want to just show you this, which is talking about durability. We're going to continue to follow these patients to 24 months. But when you look at the patients who were randomized to 10 kilohertz stimulation, that decline to 1.7 for a VAS score at six months is maintained again at the nine and the 12 month time period. And that responder rate for the greater than 50% pain reduction that was as high as 86% at six months maintains again out to 86% responder rate at 12 months as well. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, this study as prospective randomized control trial showed, first of all, 
highly effective benefit of using a 10 kilohertz spinal cord stimulator for the treatment of refractory painful diabetic neuropathy. Compared to conventional medical management, which is the gold standard today, there was a significant responder rate. There were improvements across quality of life. There were 62% of patients with stimulators who had sensory and other neurological improvements. And so what we've demonstrated is that 10 kilohertz stimulation is both safe and effective for this population with PDN, and that there's durability of their response out beyond 12 months as well. As I've mentioned, we continue to follow these patients for a full 24 months, and we will have additional evaluation of those outcomes as well as health economic data as we continue to collect the data going forward. I couldn't have done this study without the help of uh, collaborating researchers, including Dr. Amber Delphin. And I want to thank all of them, as well as the patients who contributed to the study, because as you can imagine, the impact that this small group of patients could have in potentially influencing the outcomes for 8 million patients who have PDN could be sizable. Dr. Peterson, thank you so much. I never get tired of hearing uh, the results of this particular study and how it's going to be a game changer for a lot of our PDM patients out there. Uh, before uh, I um, uh, open um, the, the audience questions and we start the discussion section of our program, I wanted to ask you, you showed us the six month data and you gave us a glimpse of your 12 month data. How long are you going to follow these patients in your study and why is that important? Yes, yeah, so the design of the study is to go to 24 months after stimulator implants. So that means that the patients who were originally randomized to conventional medical management who chose to cross over will be followed for a total of 30 months, six, six in the CMM, and then 24 months for the, um, the post-implant stimulator data points. And I think it'd be really useful for us to be able to then think about those patients that we've watched cross over and they serve as their own control now to see what happens for 24 months after stimulation when you have their baseline recorded for those first six months in CMM. The other thing that's really important here is that uh, when we look at other, other treatments, particularly the low frequency data that I showed, uh, the attrition of response is in those first 12 to 24 months. And so carrying out the durability evaluation beyond 24 months has a lot of importance to us in terms of the other health factors that we're seeing for patients, as well as demonstrating durability and their longer term outcomes. Excellent. Thank you so much. I'd like to invite all people to come back online and, and turn on their videos and their microphones go through with questions to get us started. I do have some specific questions for every single one of you. The audience here are entering their questions as well. Like I said, we'll go through as many relevant questions as we can within the allocated period of time that we have. But I want to start with Dr. Strand. Dr. Strand, um, you've been treating a lot of painful diabetic neuropathy patients in your practice, um, and you obviously are an expert in the medication management and the conservative treatments for the patients. Now that we have this as data for painful diabetic neuropathy using 10,000 hertz spinal cord stimulation. Is your algorithm changing for your PDN patients? Well, you know, I, um, yes, is the short answer. I mean, this is always something that I wanted to do being someone who does neuromodulation. I mean, it makes sense to you to use it in an off label way, but of course we couldn't really get that covered. So you'd run into sort of these barriers when wanting to do this for patients. So to me, having something, um, kind of be in my toolkit, for these patients is amazing. And one of the things I really appreciated about this study was that it was, it was a very representative population of these patients. You know, A1Cs could be up to 10. They could be up to 120 milligrams of morphine per day. It wasn't sort of this cherry picked, you know, optimal population. It was a very real group of people. And so to me, you know, in pain medicine, we don't get people that haven't really tried anything, right? They, that's managed excellently in primary care and endocrinology and neurology. So by the time they come to my clinic, especially at a tertiary academic center, they've really tried first, second, third line agents. Um, so the fact that these patients have A1Cs, they're a little elevated, they, they've, they're on opioids, they've failed to, you know, neuropathic um, pain agents already, th that's a very real representation of who I see. And so I, I definitely am appreciative to have a new therapy and again, the efficacy is just mind blowing. Um, I can't wait to, to see if my practice mirrors this um, because, you know, going from 
you know, a high sevens to high ones or low twos is it's just phenomenal. So I'm really excited to add this into my armamentarium to, to treat these patients. I couldn't agree with you more as somebody who's been practicing pain management for 23 years. It's really refreshing for us to be able to treat this specific patient population, mainly because of the fact that we just haven't had that much to be able to do for them um, uh, for a very, very long time. Thank you for that answer. Dr. Holzer, uh, you're an expert in postoperative infections. In fact, uh, you've published quite a bit of evidence on these. Um, Dr. Peterson referenced you in one of her slides as she was presenting her uh, uh, evidence to us. So I, I want to know, in the diabetic patient population, for us surgeons who do these implantable devices on a regular basis, does it concern you in this particular patient population? Why or why not? Well, as you mentioned, much of my research uh, back when I was at Mayo before leaving academics centered on infection. So the quick answer to your question is absolutely infection concerns me with every spinal cord stimulator patient because it's a, it's a devastating side effect, a, a complication, not devastating in that you can remove it, but a patient is doing super well with the therapy and then you have to take it out because of an infection. It's really discouraging for the, for the patient. I will say that in the study we did with the 2,700 patients, we did not show an increased rate of infection amongst diabetic patients, which really surprised me. Now, a reason for that might be that this was a retrospective study, and it may be that physicians that were caring for those patients knew, hey, I remember from all my training that diabetic patients are more prone for infection, and so they took extra caution, were extra careful, made sure the prep was really good, uh, made sure they screened the patient for other history of surgical side infections. So we didn't see an increased rate for diabetic or for any um, diabetic patients in our study. So I was kind of uh, validated to see that in Dr. Peterson and in this large study, the infection rate was really kind of right in line with that, which tells us that yes, we always have to be worried about infection, but not necessarily to an extreme rate here with these diabetic patients. I think we need to take, uh, have caution and care and caring for them, but that we can safely implant them with these devices. And again, it's a reversible therapy. so heaven forbid an infection does come along, it's uh, a treatable thing after explaining the device. So yes, I worry about it, but I was really happy to see that, that those rates were very similar in our study and that these patients have an opportunity to get this therapy. That's absolutely true. The infection rate we showed in this study was fairly low and comparable to the evidence that we've seen in the, in the patient populations with spinal cord stimulators without diabetes as well. Uh, Dr. Peterson, my question for you is about the sensory improvement that you saw in your patient population in this study. Um, that's very new. We've never seen that before in, in any spinal cord stimulator study, and it, it's actually very compelling. Can you speak to the sensory improvements that the PDN patients enjoyed? And uh, we know about it so far and where we think we should be taking this. Yeah, no, I, I agree. It's one of the most interesting things to have somebody say that they went from uh, not being able to feel the floor to being able to discern blades of grass under their feet again, for example. It's anecdotally, it's amazing. Um, and, and I think it, the time course, people ask me often, like, what's the mechanism of how this happening? And I think there's a few different things that are going on. And this needs to be looked at more. Some initial research has been done, for example, looking at confocal microscopy and getting some punch biopsy uh, samples to try to identify what sort of tissue changes are happening. But I had patients, we put a temporary stimulator in for about a week prior to then putting a permanent stimulator in to make sure the patients respond to the therapy and that it's really cut out for them. And some patients would have sensory improvements within their first two to three or four days of ever having a stimulator, um, even during that temporary trial. Other patients may not have noticed any sensory changes during that temporary stimulation window, but by the one month, three month time period, they were reporting those sensory changes. So that suggests to me that there may be a few different mechanisms at work. One of those, I think, for those that are reporting fairly immediate changes is potentially uh, what I call the nightclub phenomenon. You know, uh, you can't hear the person next to you talking because the band is so loud, but when you can get the band quiet, you can hear the conversation. And I think there's a group of patients that probably have more preserved sensation than they're aware of, but their painful neuropathy has drowned it out. And if you're able to then decrease that volume of the pain, then the residual sensory 
um, capacity that's there um, is much more notable and is present. And so I think that's where the immediate mechanism is, is probably something like that. In the longer term, we need to really study and get a better handle on what's happening mechanism wide. Um, because if there really are microvascular changes, uh, remyelinization, other changes in growth factors that are happening along the um, ends of these long nerve fibers, then we're talking about something that goes to what Dr. Strand said about disease modification. And it is too early for me to do anything other than hope right now. Uh, but I know this is an area where we are actively pursuing opportunities to investigate further. I love that answer. Thank you so much, Dr. Peterson. Now I'm going to go to some of the audience questions and I'll address the questions to every single one of you one by one. But please uh, feel free to chime in if you feel like you have something to add. Uh, Dr. Strand, the first few questions are obviously for you since you started us out. One of the, the audience members is asking if buprenorphine patch could be effective for painful diabetic neuropathy. Certainly it can. Um, you know, it's, you know, opioids, especially opioids that have mixed um, targets can be effective. As I mentioned earlier, the, the data is not that great for long-term opioid use. You know, you still have the uh, problems with tolerance, dependence, addiction, diversion, uh, being on a controlled substance. So, you know, while I, I think in the short term, it, it might be helpful, I would probably discourage people in the long term from using that. Um, unless, you know, we all know that sometimes you you get backed into a corner with somebody who's just not doing well, and you're willing to do whatever you can to, to get them safely to a place that's more comfortable. So I would put the Butrans patch in that arena. So yes, it can be effective, but I wouldn't personally suggest it for long term treatment of painful diabetic neuropathy, really, unless, you know, you've kind of tried and failed all of your other options. I agree with you 100%. There's been a few questions about Metanex. Uh, have any of you had any experience with Metanex and painful diabetic neuropathy? Um, I haven't personally, you know, that's a, it's a vitamin B supplementation. And I think as far as supplements in general, um, most of them are pretty well tolerated. You, you know, you can talk about alpha lipoic acid, you can talk about B12, um, you can talk about Metanex or vitamin B. Um, you know, the studies, are small. And there was a lot more kind of 10 years ago, I feel like there was a lot more attention there. I'm not really sure why the decrease in, in efforts um, with studies you know, have changed over the last 10 years. I'm assuming that maybe the larger trials didn't bear out. Maybe there was some publication bias with what didn't get presented. But, um, you know, on the, on the Mayo Clinic website for managing painful diabetic neuropathy, they, they do suggest trying B12 or alpha lipoic acid and, and state that in in approved doses, the side effect profile is very mild. Excellent. You answered my next question about the alpha lipoic acid as well. Thank you. Um, Dr. Holzer, the next question is for you. What traits may make a patient not a good candidate for a CS in general? It's just about patient selection for spinal cord stimulation. Can you speak to that just a bit, please? Sure. I think the number one is expectation. If a patient has been debilitated by pain, for 20 years and comes to you and says, I'd like to get the stimulator in and can we get it in by August? Cause I'd like to train for a marathon and then maybe compete in an Ironman next year. Cause I'll, I'll be a zero out of 10 for pain. That's not a good recipe for success. So the expectation is what we've seen in these studies an absolute improvement in pain and improvement in function but not all of a sudden, you know superhuman skills. That's one big uh, concern is if the expectations aren't uh, in line with what the therapy can do. Beyond that, a person with uh, untreated and undiagnosed mental health illnesses, uh, certainly a patient that suffers from severe dementia or Alzheimer's that maybe isn't being picked up by the doctor in the office, wouldn't be a really great candidate because they would have a hard time giving feedback on whether or not they were getting improvement. And if a patient had an unrecognized and untreated addiction, that could also be a challenge in these cases. And so those things are all screened for prior to going down the path of spinal cord stimulation. Got it. Thank you so much. The next question is for Dr. Peterson. Have you seen any episodes of overstimulation using 10 kilohertz SCS uh, with your PDM patients? Um, because we've seen that from time to time with failback surgery syndrome patients where we need to turn down the amplitude. Yes, um, two components to that. One is actually that we've seen that over time, patients who are effectively treated need less dose at 12 months than they did initially. So, uh, so that effectively treated patients actually can be turned down over time. And the advantage of stimulating at a lower dose is this is a rechargeable generator. The patient charges wirelessly through the skin. And so uh, if they're using 
uh, less power, then the, your charging routine is a little bit uh, less frequent or, or just shorter in duration for them. So that adds to patient convenience and comfort and that in turn uh, it promotes adherence to uh, the use of their device. But yes, you can get overstimulation with 10 kilohertz stimulation. We've seen that, uh, as you said, in uh, post-laminectomy stimulation patients, but also in PDN patients. Some patients have a described feeling as if their toes were cramping and curling under. And, uh, and that is something that, again, Again, with just adjusting the settings and, and smoothing the uh, intensity of stimulation that uh, typically can be resolved fairly easily. These devices are very easy to readjust and reprogram. The patients are able to do a lot of that with their own controller. Excellent. Thank you. Dr. Holzer, the next question is for you. How often do these devices have to be changed? So the systems are uh, meant to be put in permanently, although they can be uh, changed. They can be explanted quite easily. The battery is rechargeable, as Dr. Peterson just described, and typically the batteries last somewhere between nine and 14 years, which we're seeing on the longer end of that. And then the battery can be changed out. It's a fairly simple procedure. It takes about 30 minutes to do, uh, maybe 45 minutes to do, but the electrodes that are near the spinal cord can stay in uh, permanently and not need to be changed. That's right. Yeah. So the battery is actually rated for about 10 years, from what I understand. And since I was involved in the uh, Sensor CT study, uh, we, we started in 2012, we still have those batteries in place and they're just now coming up for replacement uh, because at, at one point they just don't hold charge anymore. The next question is for Dr. Peterson and it's about uh, the use of opioids in the subjects you enrolled in the study. Was there any correlation between the pre-op opioid use and the success of the SDS at all? And were all the patients taking opioid analgesics in the study? So, uh, so those are great questions. So no, not all patients were taking opioids, although in order for them to enroll in the study, they needed to have taken a gabapentinoid and at least one other class of pain medication and have had failure of treatment of their symptoms with those medicines in order to qualify for the study. And that's because we wanted to have patients who had refractory PDN uh, enroll in the study. And so in some instances, that medication was opioid. As, uh, as you saw on the slide that I showed, we had a, a sizable number of patients who decreased in the use of opioids or discontinued them completely during the study, but we also had a few patients who started or increased their dose during the study as well. So that was tracked along, but uh, uh, there also did not seem to be a significant correlation with responder rate with the opioid dosing. Um, and uh, uh, although obviously that's something that we are very concerned about. And I still will admit, tell you that the best time to try to consider intervening with a stimulator based on what we've seen for the patient responders here is before initiating opioids at all. Excellent, thank you. The next question is about coverage of these devices. And I can certainly answer this question, but I'd love for all of you to chime in. The question is, will Medicare, Medicaid, and private insurance cover um, a 10,000 hertz spinal cord stimulator device for painful diabetic neuropathy? And the answer is eventually, yes. You know, the indication came through just recently. Uh, Dr. Peterson, what was the date uh, when the FDA actually gave the indication for painful diabetic neuropathy to 10,000 SCS? Yeah, so the FDA approval announcement um, was made public on uh, July the 19th, so really just four weeks ago, and, uh, and it is a purely uh, labeling for 10 kilohertz spinal cord stimulation, so while there are other spinal cord stimulators on the market, including the low-frequency ones that I talked about, the FDA approval is purely for PDN using 10 kilohertz stimulation, and to that end, uh, the company uh, never that makes that stimulator has a reimbursement specialty office and they work with implanting physicians to help with insurance clearances, pre-certification process. So, so if I today had a patient in my office who I thought was a qualified candidate and I was concerned about navigating the insurance reimbursement, I could enlist the services that are provided through that company to support my own office staff in uh, trying to navigate the reimbursement landscape to qualify that patient. Excellent. And my answer to that, um, to Dr. Peterson's point is that at this point, it's a case by case basis. 
the manufacturer of this device, the, the people who brought us this technology are supporting us in trying to get us authorization by sending the supportive evidence to, to uh, the insurance companies. They're in direct communication with the payers for us to be able to get this paid uh, from the onset. It's something that we're all working on and knock on wood so far in Northern California, I have not seen a problem for my PDM patients. Dr. Strand, Dr. Holzer, do you have any comments about this at all? Um, I have trouble either. Got it. Dr. Strand, you were about to say something as well? No. I haven't had any problems. Nice, very good. So uh, one of the questions that came through, um, uh, Dr. Strand, is a medication question. How many traditional agents would you try before you engage patients uh, with uh, uh, 10,000 hertz SCS for PDN? Well, my answer for this is the same as my answer would be for spinal cord stimulation or neuromodulation for any condition. Um, I think keeping it simple is the best way to start. And the steps and how aggressive I'm going to be depends on how much distress the patient is in and how they're doing. So if a patient has like mild to moderate pain, I might take a year or two years trying to optimize their pain control, you know, topical agents, different oral agents. If a patient is coming to me in nine out of 10 pain and they're depressed and they're anxious and they can't sleep, you know, I might get aggressive a little sooner. So, you know, at the very least based on the study, you know, I would certainly have at least two failed agents, uh, realistically, um, you know, maybe three or four even, because by the time they come to me, they may have already tried a couple of things, then I'm going to give my own hand at trying a couple of things. Um, but it, it depends a lot on how miserable the patient is and any other comorbidities. I mean, are they on anti, um, or are they on blood thinners that they can't come off of because they, they've had a recent, you know, cardiovascular event or, you know, is their body habit is not ideal and they would like to lose some weight first, you know, do they want to get some depression or anxiety under control first? So you certainly want to optimize comorbidities. I don't think there's a chance to rush, but also if you think someone's an excellent candidate and they're in a lot of pain, I don't really think there's a reason to wait either. So I think you just have to tailor the approach, you know, to the most appropriate um, for that individual patient. I love that answer. And you're absolutely right. You know, one thing that we do is uh, we, we learn who is a really good candidate for implantology. And that's part of the experience that we gain as interventional pain physicians. But to your point, in this particular study, the patients would have had to fail at least two different agents, maximized by in the hands of the physician before they could actually get into the study. That's really, really important to remember. Thank you for that answer. So, um, there is also another question about um, um, other neuropathies. Dr. Peterson, were other neuropathies studied in this um, uh, particular study? And would uh, 10,000 Hertz SCS work for any other neuropathy, such as uh, chemotherapeutic uh, indu 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 induced neuropathy? Uh, so, um, so that's where that pilot of PPN, the polyneuropathy pilot, um, certainly showed promise for multiple different neuropathies in the lower extremities. The strongest signal was in PDN, and that's why the, uh, the randomized control trial was taken on that fo focus diagnosis for diabetics with painful diabetic neuropathy. But uh, between the pilot study, as well as some other anecdotal studies and small case series that are out there, um, there certainly is benefit in other kinds of neuropathy. Um, chemotherapy induced neuropathy is one of those areas where um, I know there's been some positive benefit, but in terms of having randomized control trial level one evidence, we don't have something that is as sizable as we have now with the PDN study. Excellent. Thank you all so much. We've gone about uh, 15 minutes past the hour. We weren't supposed to go beyond 60 minutes, but the conversation was so compelling and the evidence is so exciting. I felt the need to be able to answer all the audience questions. There's a lot more here, but I'd like to invite the audience to engage pain physicians who actually do 10,000 Hertz SCS within their community to be able to understand this better. There's a lot more information on, on this uh, study, and the study has been published in JAMA Neurology, and hopefully we'll have more data coming very soon from Dr. Peterson and her team. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like to conclude the PME program. I'd like to thank Dr. Peterson, Dr. Strand, and Dr. Holzer uh, for uh, just really exciting information. Thank you so much, and um, I wish you all a wonderful evening. Thank you. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.